steel deer. I rather enjoy zebrafish. They are absolutely adorable little critters. They are also rapidly becoming a scientist's best friend, easier to keep than rats, with a surprising number of similarities to humans. And zebrafish have become an invaluable component in recent years in research into cancer and heart conditions, especially since zebrafish hearts have quite an unusual ability. Unlike most animals, zebrafish can heal their own hearts. And that is interesting enough in itself. But today I thought we'd do something a little more fun with some zebrafish, because apparently there are some people out there who don't find genetic research interesting. So today instead I thought it might be a little more fun to look at some social research using zebrafish. Because zebrafish are social animals, they like to shoal together. And zebrafish shoals can tell us quite a lot, actually. Because, like most social animals, they form social hierarchies. To a degree, anyway. The cohesion of a shoal, for instance, is quite telling of how close the members are. And within those shoals, there are more dominant and assertive members, and there are more submissive and diminutive members. And you can tell which of the fish are the most important and most in control and powerful fish, because they will be the ones who are swimming strongest, moving around the most, and they will be the ones who generally determine the direction that the shoal moves in. And that's where things get interesting, because this is actually somewhat similar to how humans behave. Popular and powerful humans tend to dictate more the overall direction that other people move in, or are at least more influential. And there's something very interesting about human social interaction, which I've talked about on this channel before, and that is that we can influence human interaction with the application of alcohol. Specifically, small to moderate doses of alcohol in humans have been shown to increase social bonding in groups. Not only self-reported amongst the people who were consuming the alcohol and meeting these people for the first time, but also from an objective observational standpoint as well. For example, groups consuming alcohol as opposed to the placebo beverage exhibit more so-called golden moments, a crucial moment in group social bonding where all the participants will smile at the same time, which, once you control for context, obviously, is a key sign of positive social relations forming. And the reason that this happens is alcohol relaxes people's inhibitions, and generally opens them up and makes them more likely to express themselves to other people. And this is so well known and has been known for such a long time that we even have a colloquialism for it. It's called having Dutch courage. Have a drink and it'll make you a little more brave and a little more assertive. But, of course, don't have too much, because otherwise you will become drunk, and then all of your inhibitions go completely out of the window, and it's an absolute disaster as you end up staggering over to the next person you see and declaring, I love you, you're my best friend, to someone that you've never met before. And apparently, zebrafish also exhibit a rather similar pattern of behaviour. And I'm going to show you some videos of this that I've dug up from the archives because it's rather interesting. So prior to this experiment being done, which we're going to look at shortly, all the other effects of alcohol that were observed on zebrafish were done in groups or in individuals. So scientists would expose an entire group of zebrafish to alcohol or individuals in isolation. And this obviously had the limitation of not allowing us to see how much the effect of alcohol would modulate how social the fish would be with other members of its species. But this experiment, rather interestingly, took a single fish, exposed it to small amounts of alcohol, and then put it in with a load of completely sober fish. And that's where things get interesting. Because in isolation, fish that were exposed to alcohol behaved no differently. But if you put a mildly intoxicated fish in with other fish, that's where things get interesting. Because that is where some very big changes in their behavior can be seen. And it's rather interestingly very similar to the effects that it has on people. So let's watch some videos. So for this experiment, a lone zebrafish was removed from its shoal, and it was popped into a solution of water and alcohol, and just left to marinate in that for a little while, before being reintroduced to all of its sober peers. So the first thing that we're looking at here is obviously the control, the 0% ethanol exposure. As you can see, our control fish is just swimming around, it's in the shoal, it's behaving completely normally. 
After being marinated in a 0.25% ethanol solution, our fish is now a little bit more cohesive than it was previously, swimming a little faster, a little bit more aggressively, but is still behaving fairly normally. Now bumping it up to 0.5% alcohol exposure, look at this little guy go. His swim speed has increased remarkably. He's a confident little fish full of swagger. And most importantly and more interestingly, the sober fish are responding to it. They are keeping up with this increase in dominant behavior in this slightly drunken fish. They're matching but have also fallen back a little bit. They're quite happy that this confident fish full of bravado is taking the lead. When we bump that zebrafish's exposure up to a 1% alcohol solution exposure, it's a disaster. The motor skills are deteriorating, which means a loss of swim speed and less accurate behavior as well. He can't keep up with the shoal as easily, and what's more, the other fish seem to not want to have anything to do with him anymore. Go home, zebrafish. You're drunk. Turns out even zebrafish don't want to hang around with someone who's had one too many. And ultimately, that is the point of this experiment. Because this highlights the very important fact that sociality modulates the effect of alcohol on a subject. Zebrafish in isolation when they're drunk don't behave any different if they're sober. When all the fish are equally intoxicated, you find that general cohesion breaks down across the board. However, in this instance, as you've seen, Individual drunk members can have increased social interaction depending on the amount of alcohol consumed, and it follows the universal pattern that you see in humans. A little bit is a good thing, and then too much and everything falls apart. But that modulation and that change in behavior is inextricably linked to social interaction. A drunkard with an audience behaves remarkably different to a drunk person sitting at home alone. And the zebrafish are no different. And this is really important because what this gives us is a little bit more of an insight into how social interactions can either magnify or mitigate the negative effects that alcohol abuse has and can potentially open up new avenues of research looking at destructive behaviors around things like alcohol abuse in humans. So there you go, zebrafish getting drunk for science so you don't have to. Of course, it's not all fun and games when it comes to alcohol. Alcohol consumption, when pregnant, for example, can lead to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, a name given to a variety of problems caused by alcohol consumption in pregnant women, which leaves a lot of very telltale signs in the children that they have. And once again, zebrafish are giving us some valuable insight into how this actually happens. Because zebrafish have two very distinct advantages here. First of all, they are relatively transparent when they're embryos. You can see right through them, so you can see everything that's going on as they grow. And secondly, it only takes a couple of days for them to actually develop. So you can basically watch these effects happening almost in real time. The video which you're looking at now is a time-lapse piece of footage from two embryos of zebrafish one of which is the control without alcohol exposure, and the other has been exposed to a small dose of alcohol. And as you can see, over the course of its development, the one which has been exposed to only 3% alcohol has its development severely retarded. And this confirms more or less what we already knew. Alcohol exposure to a fetus or an embryo is a bad idea. But it's not all doom and gloom. Because thanks to the zebrafish, we have learned about the importance of something called retinoic acid, which is very important in zebrafish for the development of their nervous system, the hindbrain, and the spinal cord. And something very interesting that has been worked out is that we can actually mitigate the damage that ethanol exposure causes by exposing zebrafish to retinoic acid. So as this image shows, you've got the control fish at the top, which exhibits normal growth. A fish exposed to a small amount of ethanol at the same time in its development, well, as you can see, its development has been affected. Most interestingly are the two images above the bottom two, which is not only exposure to ethanol, but also to retinoic acid. And as you can see, those two embryos have developed at more or less the same rate as the control. 
In essence, exposure to this retinoic acid has limited the amount of damage that the ethanol has done by quite a large margin. And the bottom two most images was retinoic acid exposure by itself, which had no particular effect. And this is something which is really, really important because what this is telling us, it's starting to give us a sign that fetal alcohol syndrome is something which may be potentially reversible if caught early enough or that we could potentially limit the damage that it does. So there you go, drunken fish. They can tell us actually quite a lot about life and how it works. Thanks, zebrafish. You guys are awesome.